Good morning. Welcome to our online worship service. My name is Kaylin Larson, and I work on our staff team here. I primarily work with small groups, hospitality, and LDI. If you haven't had a chance yet to join us in person, we'd love for you to do so. We have two services that meet on Sunday mornings downtown. Our mission is to help as many people as possible become fully devoted followers of Christ. We desire for people to know Jesus more intimately. The best way to get connected is to visit our website at hopecc.com connect. In just a few moments, you will see our worship team come on screen and lead you through a few songs of worship. After that, our pastor will give his message and lead you into a time of reflection and prayer. We're really glad you're joining us this morning. Will you please pray with me? Lord, we are grateful for who you are. We're grateful that you are a God who sees us and knows us. And we pray, God, that you would soften our hearts and open our ears to your word this morning. We love you. Amen.
nothing but the blood of Jesus for my cleansing. Please, I believe nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hope Community Church. My name is Cor Shemaleski. If I haven't had the chance to meet you, I'm the lead pastor of our downtown location. And this is the most significant weekend of the year. It is Easter. It is the time in which the church will remember Jesus in his death and in his resurrection. Jesus in his crucifixion. And then not staying dead, but being raised to new life. And so, so grateful that you could join with us. I uh, came to faith. Uh, in Jesus Christ as a 19-year-old, and my story is, is such that, you know, coming to faith in Christ at that time when, when life really had fallen apart, really excited to get to know people, get to know the church, get to know this message more deeply, and I happened to be at a church on Easter Sunday, and I'll never forget it because the, the preacher said, I, you're probably expecting me to speak on the realities of Easter, that Jesus suffered, died, and was raised. You're probably expecting me to preach that. And it's, yeah, it's Easter, right? And he said, uh, I'm not, but I'm not, I'm not going to preach on that this weekend. And, and, and the crowd was kind of waiting for the punchline. Like the, the church kind of started laughing. And, and then he just said, no, I'm serious. I'm going to go a different direction uh, today. And really the only other mention of the fact that it was Easter was we, as we exited the sanctuary, kind of they flashed on the screen, he is risen. And that, and that was it. And that was, even as a, as a new believer in Jesus Christ, that was surprising to me. And it just causes me to wonder, like, like in heaven, well, you know, like, do, do I get the chance to, like, like talk to the to that preacher and like do you think we get the chance to be like bro i mean come on it was easter man preach on the resurrection and then i sure the situation will be reversed and he'll come up to me and he'll be like bro that that sermon that one time like come on what were you thinking but all that to say we're not going to be novel this morning we're not trying to surprise or throw you off we are going to put uh front and center the message of Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. Uh, a couple quotes regarding the importance of this. Uh, Jürgen Moltmann is a German theologian, and he says this. The inner criterion of whether or not Christian theology is Christian lies in the crucified Christ. The cross is the test 
of everything. The cross is the test of everything. If you actually want to know if, if something is distinctly Christian, then we, we look to the cross. Does it, does it come forth from and, and remind us of the cross of Jesus Christ? That is what makes Christianity. Christianity is the cross. Uh, Fleming Rutledge, who's an American Episcopal priest, she, in her book uh, on the crucifixion, says this, the key to Jesus is now, as it has always been, his crucifixion and resurrection. His crucifixion and resurrection. That, that is why we gather to celebrate on Easter uh, weekend. It is the heart and pulse and foundation of our faith. And so uh, what it lacks for in creativity this morning and surprise and uh, being novel, it will more than make up for in substance as the central guiding principle of our faith, that Jesus Christ lived, died, and was raised. This past Friday, we met as a congregation, actually not just our downtown location, but we invited uh, Lower Town and Columbia Heights to join us, and we took part together in a Good Friday service with the title, Come All Who Are Weary. That Jesus is not a taskmaster like you might might have been uh, had that conceptual conceptualized for you as a young person or in your church experience that that jesus just wants more from you and he's just constantly saying do it do it again but truly that jesus is a compassionate caring loving god who wants those who are weary who are tired who are burdened to come to him and experience life. And this is such an important principle, this, this idea of Good Friday and Jesus and his, his death, his crucifixion, that I, I, I must address it in further detail. Even this morning, even as we're celebrating his triumph, uh, triumphant victory over death, we need to review because the cross, the crucifixion is so vital uh, in our faith. And so, want to go back and, and speak to the realities of the crucifixion. And, and the crucifixion, the death of Jesus Christ, has so much bound into it. And, and we're not going to be able to address everything. We're not going to be able to cover everything. But things like blood and sacrifice and sin or sin offering, guilt or guilt offering, big fancy words that, that you might not know, and that's okay, like, like expiation or atonement. It's okay if you don't know what those are. But those are connected to Jesus and his work on the cross. Things like substitution, lamb or lamb of God or the sacrificial lamb of God. Uh, language like the suffering servant. Like Those are many ideas that speak to the reality of Jesus in his suffering and in his death. And so I want to just read one of the gospel accounts. So the story of Jesus and his life and death is captured in four different narratives, four different stories in our Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, and I want to read the account from Matthew's gospel regarding how it was that Jesus came to die. Beginning in verse 31. They, uh, then they led him, Jesus, away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced Simon to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at Jesus, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, something that Jesus had said previously, you who said he was going to do that, save yourself, come down from the cross if you are the son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, 
but he can't save himself? He's the king of Israel? Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, uh, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and, gave, and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again, in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn into from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened. They were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. A couple things to note before we move on. It's, it's interesting, it's intriguing to see how many people in this account were beckoning Jesus to save himself from death. Save yourself, right? Let's see if somebody comes and saves him from this death. And unwittingly, not understanding, not knowing and grasping the moment, Jesus is not trying to keep himself from death, but rather, rather he is trying to, through his death, save all of them. He's not trying to save himself from death, but rather, through his death, save everybody else. And Jesus, when he ha hangs on that cross and he finishes the work, he cries out, it is finished. It is finished. The work that the Father has established for me to do, the work of the cross, the work of salvation, it is finished finished. And you might be wondering, what, what is that? What does it mean that we need salvation or that Jesus is the Savior or the Rescuer? What, what is that? What, what does he accomplish on the cross? It's certainly a question I had as I was coming to faith and wrestling through these things as a 19-year-old. Going back now to some of Fleming Rutledge's words, she's the one again who uh, wrote the book, The Crucifixion, Understanding the Death of Christ. She lists at least two. It's not, it's not less than this. It, it certainly can be more than what Jesus did in his work, in his ministry. But at the least, there's these two things. There is sin and guilt for which atonement needs to be made. There is sin and guilt for which atonement needs to be made. And there is slavery, bondage, and oppression from which humankind needs to be delivered. So there is sin. There's guilt, the darkness, the imperfections, the, the breakdowns in our world, the breakdowns that we have between one another and between us and God. There is sin and guilt for which atonement must be made. Atonement is a fancy way to say for which covering or forgiveness, right? There, there's a, a, an atonement and a covering over sin and guilt that Jesus alone is able to bring forth through his death on the cross, that we are in fact covered like a warm blanket on a cold winter's night. He covers us in the face of our sin and, and guilt. Additionally, there is slavery, there's bondage, there's oppression, there's ways in which the entire system, the entire world has experienced the, the ramifications and the breakdown and the brokenness because of 
sin. And we need to be delivered up out of that. We need to be rescued as a people up out of life that's tainted with bondage and oppression and darkness and death. It's not just you and I having a relationship with Jesus. It is that. But it is God wanting to bring a redemption throughout the entire world, the cosmos, to everything. Can it be more than that? Is it more than that? Sure, but it, but it can't be less than that. We need the cross to bring a rescue and a salvation with regard to those two ideas. And yet there is this aversion, a, a repulsion. There's, there's this somehow, even in church, this idea of the blood of Christ or the death of Jesus Christ or crucifixion. Many times people kind of push that to the side for maybe what they feel are more favorable pictures of Jesus. Jesus walking alongside a stream, leading people, teaching people, healing people. Many times the cross can get pushed aside. About that, I think, Douglas John Hall speaks against sidelining the cross. In his book, God and Human Suffering, he says, the propensity of religions is to avoid suffering, to have light without darkness, vision without trust and risk, hope without an ongoing dialogue with despair, in short, Easter without Good Friday. Or, or to have the resurrection without the cross. And I don't think this is just the propensity of religions. I think it's our propensity. <laughs> like as we go through life, we want to avoid suffering. We want to have light, not darkness. I want to have vision and understanding without having to trust or without having to risk anything. I want to have hope absent of despair. It's me, it's us, I think, that want to have the victory of, of Easter Sunday and resurrection and, and life everlasting without actually having to acknowledge the horror, the suffering, the travesty of Good Friday, that, that Jesus, the, the only perfect one, the one who is least deserving of death, actually died. As one commentator put it, puts it, God is murdered. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is crucified, died, and buried. And yet, we know, because of the testimony of Scripture, that this is God's plan. That this is the plan and work of Jesus Christ on the cross, not to save himself from death, but rather through death to bring salvation to us. It says in 1 Peter 2.24, and he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. That in a nutshell, in himself he bore our sins in his body on the cross. Dealing with the sin and the guilt, bringing atonement, addressing slavery, bondage, and oppression, from which we need to be delivered because of the cross. And so as we conceive of this, as we think about this, as you hear the description of Jesus, the Son of God, dying, I just have to ask, where would we be if it wasn't for the cross? For the Christian. We're, we're not going to go somewhere else on Easter. We are going to talk about Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. We are going to talk about the death and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Because friends, where would we be if it wasn't for the cross? If we didn't have the promises of forgiveness and atonement and covering for our sin, if we still had to bear that ourselves, the weight and the penalty and the shame and the brokenness. Truly for the Christian, the cross is everything. The cross is the test of everything. I was even talking with a, a, a hope person earlier this week. Do we understand that Christianity, that, that the reality of Jesus' death, that it's, it's not even about us turning our eyes upon him. 
It says in the Bible, fix your eyes upon Jesus. And many times we start to wonder, like, am I good enough about fixing my eyes on Jesus? Am I doing a good job? Am I consistent enough? Am I, am I doing that with enough faith? Take your eyes off yourself. It's not even about you looking to Jesus. It's just Jesus. The message of Good Friday is Jesus crucified. That's it. Not about how good we are about remembering that or seeing that or fixing our eyes. Christ crucified. That is the word of the cross. That is the message of the cross. Christ crucified. Jesus bringing us forgiveness, grace, kindness, salvation. The second half of the Easter message now is getting us to resurrection. It is the fact that Jesus has been declared as risen from the grave, risen from the dead. There's many other words that describe this reality. Victory, deliverance, healing, Christus, victor, king and kingdom, heaven, freedom, power, exodus, triumph. Death is arrested. So many descriptions of this reality that Jesus didn't stay dead, but he rose from the grave. I want to read an account from Matthew's gospel and then unpack it a little bit more of the, the consequential reality of, of Jesus rising from the grave and how it intersects and impacts us in our faith. It says in Matthew 28, after the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now, I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said to them. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. A couple things to note. It is so simple it is it is so simplistically described here he has risen and yet it is so phenomenal because we don't see this every day somebody gets up from the grave who is raised to life though they died yet they live and jesus is the one who has died and been raised and how about the response of the women afraid shocked right and yet filled with joy we sing a lyric in the the song that we so often start our easter services with that jesus christ is risen today there's a lyric and a line that i think is so wonderful in describing what we just read in this story in this narrative account it's the line death in vain forbids him rise and then we sing Alleluia, which is to say we praise the Lord on account of that lyric being true. Death in vain forbids him rise. Death wants to say to Jesus, I forbid you from rising from the grave. I forbid it. You are not permitted, and yet death in vain. Death is unable to forbid Jesus to rise from the grave. That ultimately Jesus triumphs over death, triumphs over the grave. That Jesus Christ has power to say back 
to death. You don't get your way. But ultimately, life, life in Christ, resurrection life, triumphing over death. And we know the consequential reality of those words. It says in Romans 6, 9 and 10, we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So important for us to hear the consequential reality of the resurrection, the implications, right? It is that Jesus triumphs over death. But also, in addition, he will never die again, and that this triumph over death is also a triumph over sin because he died on account of sin. And so what we understand is the resurrection demonstrates the validity of the cross. It demonstrates that the cross ultimately does account for every sin, every woe, every pain, every trauma, every brokenness. It is in the resurrection that we see God saying yes to the cross of Jesus Christ. It worked. The cross worked. And Jesus now is Lord over all. Sin is not Lord of all. Death is not Lord of all. But rather Jesus in his resurrection, in his victory over death, is depicted as Lord over all. That there is nothing greater, nothing stronger, nothing more important. The crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ is paramount. It's everything for us, not just in this weekend, but for our faith. It's the foundation. You might be sitting there thinking, yeah, pastor, you don't really know me. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know of the toil or the pain or the sin or the darkness that I have experienced in this life. I don't. I might not know the specific details. But the reality, the, the testimony, the, what the Bible says about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, about what his death and his crucifixion actually means and what his victory and resurrection entails, it speaks to all sin everywhere. Your sin, my sin. In another one of our songs, we sing a great line. It says, though great our sin." And sore our woes, his grace much more abounded. Though great our sins. And friends, we, we can kind of say, yeah, I, I really have a lot of sin. Or, or, or my sin is weighty. Or it is great. It is large. It is dark. It's ugly. We can say that. And even as we say that, we really only understand it in a very, very small fashion. Because we can have only so many thoughts in our head. But truly, like, how great is our sin before an all-knowing God? I mean, we, we think of our sin, and, and it's probably just very miniature in view of what God conceives our sin to be. And yet, even so, though great our sin, and sore our woes, his grace much more aboundeth. And sore our woes. You and I. In this life, we've experienced woes, right? Woe that are very painful, traumatic. Some of you had plans for your life. And the sin and the woes have taken you in a completely different direction. And you're so sore. You're so broken. And you're so hurting. It's not a stretch to say you're devastated. And yet, though great our sin and sore our woes, his grace, his grace much more abounded. It doesn't say his grace barely can cover us. It doesn't say for you he barely covers. Everybody else, they get the abounding grace. But you, we barely covered. 
your woes. We barely covered you. No, it says his grace much more aboundeth. Whatever your sin, and we can only conceive probably of a small reality or our woe. God sees it all. Every sin, every woe, every pain, every sore, he sees it. And his grace much more aboundeth. His life, his victory, his compassion, his forgiveness. Hope community, it much more aboundeth than any sin and any woe. You might still not be convinced. I want to share from Jackie Hill Perry. She's an African-American uh, follower of Jesus Christ. She's a wife, a mom, a writer, a teacher, a poet. And she shares about being a sexual abuse and trauma survivor. And I want you to hear how she conceives of the resurrection, how she conceives of though the great sins and woes that are sore in her life, how God's grace has much more abounded to her. She says this, trauma makes you inquisitive. It makes you doubt everything and everybody. It makes you squint your eye at the familiar, rummage through your memories, and project what you gathered onto anybody that might mimic it. It makes you afraid to be yourself, to be honest, to have faith in anything other than God and your own feeble attempts at self-preservation. At this point, heaven is my ultimate hope of healing. This incomplete healing is what propels my hope for a more sufficient one. A healing that is not limited by space and time. A healing that isn't undone by what triggers me here. There, in heaven, is when I will be made whole. And not merely by faith, but tangibly. I will see it. I will feel it. I will know it. It will be an eternal reality. Because what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. This body, with all of its fear and shame, will be done anew. His resurrection is all of the proof that I need that he will make all things new. And not just this world and the heaven and the church, but me. My mind and my heart and my body will resurrect into something glorious. And this is our hope that all will be made right one day, even when it doesn't feel like it. And don't think that when I speak about heaven, I am disregarding the trauma of today. I speak about heaven because it reminds me that today and all of its troubles are not eternal. So I can be honest about my struggle without being cynical. And I can look forward to what is to come without being negligent. Jesus is healing me. And Jesus will heal me. It is an already and not yet reality that has made my days much brighter. Yes, it hurts still. But what has happened to me or us won't hurt forever. Trauma will not have the final say. Jesus will. And I just have to ask, do you believe that? Though great our sins and sore our woes, his grace much more aboundeth. Do you believe that? To put it differently, where would we be if it wasn't for the resurrection? Where would we be if Jesus hadn't gotten up out of the grave? Would we still be wondering, is our sin too great? Are the woes of our life too sore? Can Jesus really not meet us in our time of need? Is it too grand for him? Did he run out of compassion, run out of love? Was he exhausted of forgiveness? Maybe our sin was too great and our woes too sore for Jesus. Where would we be if it wasn't for the resurrection? Questions would remain. 
doubts would prevail. Sin would not have been atoned for, but the resurrection, friends, the resurrection screams of God's victory. Good Friday worked. And therefore, we don't sideline the suffering of Jesus Christ. We don't sideline his death. We don't sideline the blood. We don't sideline his body being broken. We rejoice in the fact that he didn't save himself from death, but rather through his death saved all of us and promises of a bright and hope-filled future where one day all death all pain, all brokenness will be forever extinguished in his glorious presence. This morning, in our in-person services, we get to celebrate baptism. And one of my favorite baptisms of all time is of Deshaun. And I love it because the cross looms large above him. I love it because he is risen in the same way that Jesus is risen. Every person getting baptized is risen up out of the water. And I love it because Pastor Davis, who baptized Deshaun, slapped him something fierce on the back because the water just goes spraying. And so much of this picture screams of God's goodness, of God's kindness, of God's salvation in Deshaun's life. But truly, friends, for any Christian who has died and been raised, we unite ourselves with Jesus in his death and in his resurrection Charles Spurgeon said this, you stand before God as if you were Christ. Why? Because Christ stood before God as if he were you. And so uh, before I pray to close, where would we be if it wasn't for Easter? Some of you, you, you are just hearing about, just learning about the realities of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. And maybe you've heard the stories, but you didn't know the meaning like we've talked about it today. Friends, this is not just a story about Christ. It's a story about us. Do you actually want to die and be raised to new life? In your brokenness, in your pain, in your shame, in your struggle, though great your sins and sore your woes, are you ready today to allow his grace to much more abound us? To, to overwhelm you, to come into your heart and to, into your life. Friends, today could be the day of your salvation. Today you could unite yourself with Jesus in his death and with his, in his resurrection. And, and maybe, maybe we get to then celebrate you in your baptism. That we will lower you into the water, whether it's in a tank on a stage or outside at a lake. We'll lower you into the water to symbolize you are one with Jesus Christ in his death. And then we'll pull you up out of the water to celebrate that you are one with him in his resurrection. That your life is anew. It's made anew in Jesus Christ. That ultimately the events of Easter are not just historical or void of meaning, but they are present. And they are being experienced by you and me today. And we get to celebrate Jesus now. And one day, friends, one eternal day, in the blink of an eye, we will pass from this life into the next. We will go from walking by faith to walking by sight. We will go from walking with herky-jerky experiences of his presence to being fully immersed in his presence. What a day that will be. Today, wherever you're at, whatever you're going through, remember Jesus in his death and resurrection Remember him in his crucifixion and resurrection. Friends, for the Christian, that is everything for you and for me and for our faith. Will you pray with me? Jesus, where would we be if it wasn't for Easter? Where would we be if it wasn't for Good Friday? Where would we be if it wasn't for the resurrection? Lost hopeless, helpless, broken, struggling, weeping. But on account of the cross, on account of the resurrection, God, we have hope today. We have joy today. We have peace today. We have forgiveness and compassion and love. We are loved today because of your work on the cross and 
you being raised out of the grave. God, these are not novel things. They are not new things. They are not creative things. But God, they are everything to us and to our faith. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your salvation in the crucifixion and resurrection. We celebrate you. We rejoice in you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not try. Thanks for joining us this morning. In just a few moments, you'll see the gospel applications come back on the screen. I would encourage you to take a moment to reflect and pray through them. As a reminder, we have two services that meet on Sunday mornings in our downtown location. We'd love to see you there.